Alrighty. Uh, today, we are going to talk about chapter nine, which is the introduction to the T. Now, let's take a step back for a second. Yesterday, we spoke about, at, at great lengths, the uh, scientific process, if you will, hypothesis testing. And that was going through everything and saying, like, what is the, uh, what, what are the procedures? How do we ensure we have good statistical output? How do we make sure that the data we have is, uh, you know, good of good quality, and it, it's just the best that it can possibly be under all of these circumstances. And that's what yesterday was all about in terms of how we interpret and make some assumptions and do all that kind of stuff. Well, when we when we look at research and we look at the statistical approach, not everything in this inferential world is like one group. I'm looking at like one student versus everybody else. All right. Sometimes, or most of the time, we're going to be using samples because this is an inferential, and we're going to have to compare one sample to another sample or just a whole sample of folks. Right. So, what we're going to do is th that we can't use the z score, we have to use a different score. So, we have to use a different approach called the t statistic instead of the z. And not having, not reading this uh, slide here, what we want, well, how I want you to think about the T is it's built on the same framework of the Z, the same process, the same moving through the pipeline, the same type of interpretation. Okay, but the difference is, is that the T test is a little bit more liberal than the Z, because when you're using T, you have to make some some assumptions about the population. See, the z-score is wonderful because we don't guess about the population. When we have our population, let's say it's the class, I add everybody up, I find the mean, that's the population mean, we're good to go. I do the standard deviation, that's the population standard deviation, I'm good to go, right? It's a very stable number, it's among that, population that we're working with. But with the T, if I'm using, let's say, a group of college students from the university, they're going to represent true, but I have to make some assumptions about the rest of, you know, the students at the university of what their scores are and things of that nature, where I can compare it to. Those are called estimates, and as I call them, guesstimates. So the thing to remember when introducing T is T is used for samples. It's a bit more liberal because there's some extra manipulation that's done. And it's, and it's interpreted the same way as the Z-score, except it's for samples. We're going to use a Cohen's D. And then we're going to also calculate something called R squared, which tells us the amount of variance accounted for. And that tells us, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later in, in our talk today, but it, it tells us how good or how consistent and reliable and how stable our findings are. All right, so here we go. Here's, here's we go. Just let's look at this from a further point of view. So we have, this is the, uh, which, which we, what we know is a standard error. And the standard error, it says approximates the population mean. Once again, anytime you see an approximation, it is a guess. So what is standard error? Standard meaning uniform, error meaning unknown. This is how, this is our value that I allude to, to say how much wiggle room do I have? So when we have this, we want this number to be small. And I mean small, like less than one or around one because the higher that number is, the more inflated that error is of, of how much variance there is. So I want this number to be small because that increases our precision and exactness. And once again, the way they express it here, just to show you that it's ratio data, okay? So that's what that's, what that's talking about. So what we have here is the standard error. Standard meaning uniform, error meaning unknown, and this tells us how good our guesstimates are. Okay. Here we see the z score, 
okay, where we're, it says right there in the front line, in the first line there, inferences about the population. And we don't have a population here, but we have to make assumptions about them when we do the t-test. And then we use the unit normal table to find out where it is. And you see there, remember we spoke about the size of the sample per cell? That n needs to be greater than 30. I said, I'd like to keep it at around 40, but I shoot for 50. And this way, I'm still good to go. So that's just from a practical point of view. OK, so the z-score, we have our differences here. We have our variance in the numerator, but the differences between the score and the population and divided by that multidimensional space or that, you know, how big is our sandbox? Okay, the z requires much more information than we have. We don't know <clears throat> with the z-test, we don't know what the um, population is. Hold on one second. Yeah, I just had I just had like a coughing attack, so I, I didn't I don't think anybody needed to hear me sitting and coughing. Uh, Z, re Z requires more information than we have. When you have population data, you don't have to do anything else. Okay, the standard deviation, you don't have to play with the monkey around with. The standard deviation is good to go. The mean is good to go. How we look at the data is different with Z. It's a very efficient streamlined approach. Okay, but we only have the sample data. So now we have to get much more we have to add layers on there. We have to add additional approaches to kind of approximate, you know, what, what, what the reality is in the population. So T is our alternative to Z, which means I can't use Z, but I have to come up with a way to look at that sample and still consider it to have some of the qualifications of the population. So, you know, it's just like looking at, that's why it's called a representative sample, because we're going to treat that representative sample in a way very much like a population. And when it says T is considered to be an approximate of Z, what they're saying is that, that it's close, but no cigar. So in this particular case, close enough is good enough. Okay, we have the estimate of the standard error. Now, that's a very unusual term to me. Because first of all, it's the it's first of all we're estimating, and what are we estimating? How much error we have? I don't know how much error we have. It's like throwing a dart, you know, at a, at a dartboard and saying, "Hope I get a bullseye." I don't know what the actual number is, and I don't even know how good my estimate is. So not only am I estimating or guesstimating, I'm estimating a number that I really don't know is kosher to begin with. So you see there, it says when the, just, I'm just taking this, we, we don't have to read the whole thing, but you can see that when the value of the, stand, of the standard deviation is unknown. So I don't know, I'm just guessing. So this is why the t-test, good as it may be for samples, is, is a liberal test. There's a lot of unknowns. It's time, it, instead of solving for x, if you will, when you have the two elements and you solve for the third, I'm guessing about two out of the three. I already know what the mean of the group is going to be because I can calculate the value of the sample, but I can't really make decisions. I have to guess on what the population stuff is. So all of a sudden, I got one foot on a banana peel and the other, you know, going into a big ditch. <clears throat> okay, estimate of the standard error here is a formula. And as you see here, and what I want you to remember from here, the estimate of the standard error. Now, we're going to be using the uh, square root of uh, S squared over N. We're going to be using this guy here. The estimate of the standard error. This is going to be our denominator. Think about the z-score, right? Think about z. My score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. I don't have the population standard deviation, and I can't call my denominator a deviation. I have to call it an error. So think about it. It's the inverse. Think about it for a second. And I'll mention this theme again as, as we continue to go on. With a z-score, I have how much difference I've 
in my denominator how much difference I've uh, captured, right? Let's say the standard deviation is 2.5. I know it's two and a half uh, standard deviations above the mean, but I can't do that with a T-score. So I use the estimate of the standard error. It's kind of like the inverse. It's like, how much wiggle room do I have? Not how much difference is there between them in a precise and exact way, but here saying like, do I have a lot of slack? Do I have a lot of wiggle room? So it's kind of inverting it. And the other thing to remember is that when you see in statistics, a square root function, regardless of what's underneath it, that is an automatic tell, if you will, that this is some sort of proxy for standard deviation. So anytime you see a square root in any article, regardless of what's underneath it, you'll know that that is a standard deviation, a proxy for it, a stand-in for it. And then you're going to be able to go out there and say, okay, uh, I know what a standard deviation does. And the minute you see that it's an estimate of something, that should tell you that that is a sample data. These are little clues that you can take with you. And when you read a research article and say, okay, now I know they're using a sample. Now I, knew that, now I know they're using estimates. Now I know that they're guessing on quite a few of these different values. And now you can read the article with a whole different kind of point of view and a whole different framework. So you can throw out that everything is precise and exact. You know, um, that everything is fits into this, you know, flap A fits into slot B so nicely and so cleanly. No, when you see this kind of stuff with the estimates, then it really is a little bit more messy. And because we have so much error occurring, we have the potential for a lot of error to occurring you'll just see the error start to build. So you, that's why you need to look at this and say, uh oh, estimates. Now I need to think about it in a very different way to see how are they controlling for the unknown. And that's what some of the other things that, we sp that were mentioned up front tell us. And we'll, get, we'll get to all this. All right, here's the T statistic. All right, M minus mu divided by S of M. Well, we just went through S of M, right? The estimate of the standard error, this is our proxy for standard deviation. So don't, don't forget, Z, T scores are built on the same framework and conceptualization as the Z. So here's my variance stuff, right? My differences, my score minus some sort of mean, okay? Minus some, uh, uh, minus, divided by a, a square root function. Okay, so here is the mean of the group minus the mean of the population, which this is going to be a guesstimate, divided by the guesstimate of the standard deviation, which we can't call standard deviation. We have to call it the estimate of the standard error. That's the nomenclature, but it works the same way as the Z. Okay, here's the computation. Uh, sample variance requires computation of the sample mean first. So what we're doing is we're going to be adding it up just the same way. And I have a spreadsheet and, uh, and a handwritten one that we're going to go through just to see how it kind of looks. And I think I've uploaded those already. Uh, N minus one scores, the sample are independent. What is degrees of freedom? I think we spoke about degrees of freedom. We use degrees of freedom with samples. Okay, N minus one. And uh, it says it's the, uh, how independent and free to vary they are. I'm pretty sure I went through a whole ranting about um, uh, degrees of freedom. But what it really does at the end of the day is, yes, it's independent and free to vary, but that doesn't make any sense to me. So, con so conceptually, I want you to think about degrees of freedom is keeping everything, with, keeping all the scores within the boundaries and not drawing outside the lines. This is an attempt, degrees of freedom is an attempt, and a very good one, to ensure that our error term stays as small as it can, okay? It's kind of like a dike around, you know, like a, like a rim, okay? So that's what I want you to think about that. That's why it's used. Okay, family of distributions. Okay, once again, just like Z, we can have a normal curve, if you will, 
or approximating the shape of a normal curve. And then we can see where the T falls into place there. Okay, now the T, because we're dealing with samples, has a little bit of a different point of view. It's not truly, the, it looks like a normal curve, but as it says there in the third, third line, uh, flatter than the normal z-score distribution. Because we're using uh, degrees of freedom, because we have all these other things that are impacting the distribution, which is not for this class, it's for a different class as to why this occurs, there's what they say greater spread than the z-score, okay? That's the second line there. So we're gonna see what the spread looks like. It just means that it's a little bit more elongated. Okay, as a function of that, there's the next line. If I start to spread it out, if I start to push down, it starts to go up. And that's what they call fatter tails, okay? And then there's a different t, ta uh, t table that we look at in order to account for some of those differences depending upon the number of people and the number of degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom right now is going to take a very important role in figuring out whether we have a statistically significant finding among a T-sample. Okay, so this is what we were kind of talking about from the last slide. You have the normal distribution here and we see that, right? And you can follow it through and you see how the tail is kind of suppressed here or depressed or flatter here. Now, if I have a degrees of freedom of 20, well, degrees of freedom of 20 means I have 21 people, okay? You can see how the peak is a little bit lower, how it's been pushed down a little bit, but look what happens to the tail. It starts, the tail starts to go up, the tail becomes larger, so that says that more scores can end up there, the possibility of it, because it's being pushed down, and with every push, there's a reaction, pushes down, and then it goes up. And if I have less people, okay, six people with a degrees of freedom of five, look how the peak is kind of really pushed down. It's no longer really peaky. It still has the basic shape of a normal curve, but look at what happens to that tail here, okay? So once again, everything is related to everything else. The less people I have, the more extreme looking that, that normal curve is going to be. It needs to be reflective based upon the degrees of freedom. Now, if I have five people or six people, this is not going to be a very stable finding. It just, it just can't be, right? Because when we talk about law of large numbers uh, and we talk about the consistency and stability of uh, samples and populations, more the better, right? But there is a topping out, but we're not gonna even get into that. Here we see the normal distribution because that's population data. And we can make this assumption very easily, the population. And the more people I add, so let's say I had 40 people here, which I said is our like, kind of like our magic number, then that peak would be up right underneath the normal curve. And, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the normal curve and the T, and the T curve. So in a long-winded way, <clears throat> what am I talking about? I just want to turn my phone up here, I forgot. That the, that the shape of the curve is affected by the number of people in the distribution. The more people in the distribution for the T, guess what? Closer approximation to the normal curve. The less people, it becomes more distended at, at the tails. The tails go up and the top gets pushed down. That has an impact on how we interpret and what the value of those data is. Here, if we see a, a T distribution with three, with four people with degrees of freedom of, of three, here at the, in the tails, you can, well, this is not, not a good representation, but I'll make the point here. Look at the size of that value, 2.3 or 2.4, right? That tells you that with, with four people, that's a large gap to make, right? 2.4 standard deviations to be different. So built into the cake here is that they know there's gonna be a lot of variance, there's gonna be a lot of noise, a lot of error potentially, and it's going to build its criterion with, with that in mind. So it's gonna make it a little bit more, okay? Inherently, it's gonna come out that way, where it's gonna be harder to get to significance. So the least number of people that I have, 
the, the harder it's going to be to get to significance because we go back to that type one, type two error stuff. The, the more people I have, okay, is going to be easier to reach significance because it's going to be more approximating the normal curve. And we'll see that as we move forward. Okay, here it is written out. Um, this is kind of a little bit more difficult, but let's just do it. I have my, I have my sample. So I'm going to have to estimate my population mean, okay? So it's my sample mean that I calculated right then and there, minus that population mean, and that's my differences, right? So they said the numerator will always capture the differences, and that would be m minus mu divided by the estimate of the standard error. Now, if the null hypothesis is true, which is what we always seek to prove, okay, it doesn't equal zero. Now, and a lot of times when you see this in statistical work, you'll see the null and the alternate, you know, being like equal zero and not equal to zero. It's not zero. It doesn't have to be zero. It just means that there's not a significant difference between the two values. So here, this means that in essence, that whatever we do, it'll always be, we, we, we assume when we're shooting for it to not have a significant difference because we work against ourselves. Okay, but this is the formula that we're going to be using, m minus mu divided by S sub m, estimate of the standard error. And we're guessing on this, and this one tells us how good our guess is, right? It's, it's like everything we don't know. Standard deviation is everything we do know. Estimate of the standard error is guessing how, how little we do know. So yeah, you can see why I'm not a big fan of the t-test because I kind of live in the scientific world of uh, precision and exactness. And this is not a very exacting type of thing. All right, enough, enough about that. Here we have the basic research hypothesis that we spoke about uh, yesterday, which we spoke about in uh, like a, a million times. <clears throat> we have a known population. We pull our sample from there. We have a mean of 30, right? We do our process, our treatment, whatever it is, and then we have the unknown population, it's called. So when you're reading a research article, they can talk about, oh, we use the population of people who wear green socks and yellow shoes. And now our treatment was we took a sample of them and we told them to put on black socks and brown shoes and how many people liked it. That would be the unknown because we don't know what their scores are going to be. It, are their standard deviations going to be the same? Yes, absolutely. It's the same people. That shouldn't change. What changes is based upon our manipulation. And because we, we've controlled for everything else, we can relatively assure our error is going to be low because that's the one thing we changed. And we can just go about and assume that everything is right. And you know what happens when one assumes about estimates? Exactly. So, okay, so just for a quick review here as the, as the chapter kind of goes through, we state the null and the alternate and we get our alpha, right? So it's uh, H sub zero equals, equals uh, the mean of one is equal to the mean of the other, right? The mean of the sample is equal to the mean of the pop. The alternate H sub one is the mean of the sample is not equal to the mean of the pop, okay? And then we select our alpha, where we start with is alpha, this little Jesus fish, alpha 0 0.05 subscript, and that's at the 95% confidence interval. We don't know what our alpha is because we have to go and find it. We have to find that value. It's not 1.96, like we showed yesterday with the Z. But that's pretty easy because population you can do whatever you want life's a breeze but you have starting have samples it becomes a lot more tricky wickets okay uh, sticky wickets uh we locate the critical region in the table in the t-test table we'll take a look at the t-test table too well we do the magical process we put everything into the black box we shake it up a few times you know, make our incantations. And then when the value comes out, we say, is our value that we calculated greater than the one from the back of the book, which is the critical value. And if it's larger than the one in the critical, than the critical value, we go winner, winner, chicken dinner. We have a statistical significant difference. 
that's it in a very broad stroke. Now, of course, we're going to drill that down a little bit, piece by piece by piece, right? Okay, so let's let's start to do that. Here, uh, from the back of the book, we have here's our uh, alpha or at 0.05 and degrees of freedom of eight. So we have nine bodies here. Here is how the normal curve looks among these people, if we were to do that. And the number from the back of the book of the alpha is 2.3. Any score that we get, which is greater than 2.3, that is a statistically significant difference. You see, we're rejecting the null. And that's plus or minus, right, 2.3. So most scores, as I said the other day, are going to fall in the centroid region, right? Right in the center, here's the mean. And then most of the scores are going to collapse around here. How many scores did I say? About 68%. So like two thirds of the scores are going to fall around here. If we add another standard deviation onto it, we're going to get another 25% or so, right? 26%, whatever it may be, but it's an additional boost. So is it uncommon for a score to fall out between the first standard deviation and the second standard de deviation? No, not necessarily, no, it can, it, it can very well happen. But where the rubber meets the road and the critical region is called a critical region for a reason is that outliers, which are significantly different than the rest of these characters, falls out beyond here. And this criterion is the number that tells us or is the value that tells us it needs to be greater and under this condition of 0.05 and nine people with eight degrees of freedom, that score needs to be greater than 2.3. If it's not 2.3, okay, if it's not 2.3, less than that or equal to a less than, fail to reject, okay? You can't reject it. So now you have to say, okay, that's different. Okay. Assumptions of the t-test. Now I said that the t-test is built upon uh, the formulation of the Z. The Z looks at population data, but conceptually, the Z is looking at the difference between one score and another score. That difference, that variation, divided by the sandbox that it's playing in the multi-dimensional space within these parameters, right? Within this framework. Same thing with T. The values in the sample must consist of independent observations. Once again, what does that mean in English? It means that independent observations means in whatever I see, I need to record in that particular way. That is the truth. So independent means there is no impingement from outside. I'm not changing any scores. I'm not doing anything, okay? So that's what independent is. Population sample must be normal. We keep talking about this. We know that because it is normal. And that's exactly what we assume. We always assume normality of data on list whole. When the sample size is large, it can violate a couple of rules because it's a little bit more forgiving. But if you're using a sample, how large are your, you know, you're not using a 10,000 person sample, you know, using 50 people. So you still have to be careful, okay? You, it will affect it. I'm not a big believer in, in doing a lot of violations of statistics. Just as a quick side note, there are seven rules of statistics. And um, every day, if I do any statistical work or we do any statistical work, Believe it or not, we're violating about four of them just by the minute we turn on our computer and look at everything. So the assumptions can be violated, but it depends which assumptions are being violated. But yeah, but I don't like to play, I don't like to play on, uh, I don't like to push it that much. Okay, the larger the sample, the smaller the error. Remember we spoke about this? Law of large numbers. The more sample that I have, will lead to greater representation of the normal curve. The larger the sample, the smaller the error. I have more things going on where there'll be less, there'll be no over justification of scores and no under justification of scores, okay? Uh, larger samples lead to consistency of uh, findings. 
it leads to stability of data. Okay, at least the stability of scores because in, with more there's always greater consistency. Um, how much is large? We spoke about that. Okay, like 40, 50 people per cell is going to be okay. We don't want error, and that's for sure. And the last part about this is when I look at the larger sample versus the small sample, just think about saying like, okay, if I have 10 people in a sample versus 100 people in a sample, 10 people in a sample, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a lot of uh, noise, a lot of variance, a lot of disruption, and a lot of discrepancies. The more folks that I have in there, those extreme points start to smooth out. And I spoke, and I spoke a little bit about smooth data because that's what we're really looking at is to say, how do I get the bigger picture? So the more data I have, imagine I'm being pulled out where you can see everything kind of holistically. The larger the variance, the larger the error. Yeah, large variance, meaning what? Lots of differences. So if I give a test and everybody's scores are all over the place, ranging from 40 to 90, and it looks like a big cloud, I'm going to have larger error because the distance between each of the scores so I don't know, right? It's gonna be harder for me to come up with. Why did somebody get a 40 and somebody get a 90? I don't know. It's a, large, it's a larger unknown for me. That's why these events occurred. So moving down to the sub bullet there, large variance means that you're less likely to obtain a significant treatment effect. Right, okay, take a step back here for a sec. When you have a large variance, that means that it's all over the place. And because of that, the statistic is not going to be able to tap into whether the treatment is making a change or whether it's just noise making the change. And because the way statistics are built, it's going to take a much more conservative approach, even with a liberal test like this. So I want you to think about it. I have everything, just a large variance. Okay, a big spread, like a standard deviation or an S sub M of like, let's say 12 for argument's sake. So that tells you when you have a large standard deviation or proxy for standard deviation, that all the scores are kind of like a big cloud. Now you tell me if I'm looking at a cloud, how am I gonna know the differences between things? If I'm looking at a distribution, that's just a big puff. I don't know, but if it's, it does, it's not showing me patterns, because what did I say about statistics? Statistics is the ability to, to organize from, from chaos to order, to look for patterns of behavior. If I have a lot of variance and all the scores are all over the place, well, guess what? Then I'm not gonna be able to get those patterns to come up. The statistical process will find, will, will not be able to define that, okay? And because we have large variance and it's harder to pinpoint whether the difference is what, <clears throat> what I've done or if there's just some other thing impinging upon us, that's going to reduce the likelihood of finding a significant result, okay? So this is why chapter eight yesterday was kind of, was, was import, is important because this tells us how to put a better study together. And as I said, if you're taking uh, experimental design 715, those are the kinds of issues because you don't want to get into a situation where you have this kind of thing going on. We have this environment going on. We have a larger variance and you can't tell anything where it's, where it's nothing going on. But there may be a true underneath it, but you can't find it. Okay, so if you're reading a research article and it'd be very unlikely that they would print something that doesn't, that, that violates all these rules and stuff. <clears throat> But for yourself, if you're working in somebody's lab and you're looking at data, not every study goes according to Hoyle, right? There, there's all kinds of issues going on. So the larger the variance that you're getting in some of your data, you may find non-significant stuff, okay? My advice to you is to, is to go back and revisit the experimental design and your process because you may have missed something, not just to say, well, we did everything, and we didn't get, we have large variance and whatever, maybe the uh, instructions weren't good, or maybe you know, some of the folks did. I would run it again. I would, I would like to see that. I would like to see it run again and maybe, and then you could throw it out if it's get the same type of thing. So you can confirm it. All right, enough of that. Uh, 
diatribe and down a rabbit hole. All right, so the hypothesis test determines whether the treatment effect is greater than chance. What does this mean in English? You've heard this a million times. This is what I was talking about, the standard error. I think they say it a little bit better here, right? Chance is how much, how much chaff do I have in the week? How much difference can I account for of error? How unprecise and unexact is what I have. So this is <clears throat> so this is finding that. No measure of the effect size of no measure of the size of the effect is included. We can't do that. A very small treatment effect can be statistically significant. This is why we need to be very careful when we use estimates, because my estimates can be totally like off the wall, whether I know it or not. You know, I can't do a study among let's say uh, third graders in urban New York City schools, and then just choose, let's say an urban school in let's say Newark, New Jersey, without drilling it down to see how, how matched is, is my sample? Are these, are these kids similar? They have the same reading skills, the same you know, makeup here and all that kind of stuff. I just can't take that and compare them to like some, some children who are you know, going to some you know, prep school can't do that, that wouldn't be right. Because that would give me all of this error and it, wouldn't, and it wouldn't happen. All right, so the results from the hypothesis test should give us a uh, Cohen's D, we're gonna have a magnitude of effect. And then because we need to know how much uh, error we have or accounted for error, we have to do something called R squares. Okay, and we're gonna be able to see that and that's gonna kind of tell us stuff. That tell us that. Uh, with Cohen's D, this is a mock up of a Cohen's D. This isn't the actual Cohen's D, it's one that had to be rigged. Cohen had to rig this for samples because he had to make sure they included those guesstimates and to tighten it up in a lot of ways to account for the looseness. Okay, once again, the, when you're doing populations, it's really, really easy because you don't have to worry that it is what it is, right? Once I start doing the estimates, and I keep saying it, it becomes, it can become somewhat problematic, okay? So Cohen's, we have the formula, and this, we have to figure out for Cohen, and we'll have that value. So, but you see here, it's the numerators, carrying the change, getting the change, and versus you know, some sort of standard deviation value or some sort of play, you know, playing field and multi-dimensional space that it's on. And we interpret Cohen the same way. If it's a 0.5 or better, we go, wow, we have a lot of magnitude of effect, just didn't get dragged over the finish line. And we can start to make you know, causal statements about it. Uh, yeah, I don't think I need to talk about this. This is an example of a book. Okay, and uh, an alternative for measuring uh, effect size. Let's talk for a second about uh, what R squareds do. And it says their percentage of variance explained. Okay, and it says some sort of alternative method for measuring effect. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Go back to what I said a while ago, and uh, maybe last, you know, maybe last week, you know, which was like. Could be four weeks ago in a semester, right? Um, everything is related to everything else, right? If I have a large effect, Cohen should reflect that, right? If I if I have a small effect, Cohen should reflect that, right? The distribution should should be if I have a if everybody gets a ninety on a test, that's going to be reflected in the standard deviation, right? Not going to be a whole lot of room between scores. It's going to be small. The standard deviation is going to be small. So therefore, the variance is going to, are going to be small, right? If I have a big cloud, the variance is going to be large, and the distribution is going to start to change from looking like a normal curve to something looking more like a cloud. Okay. Having said that, one way also to look at this, which is quite important, is to say how much variance is my study explaining? What does that mean in English? Well, I already looked at through the estimates how much error I have and whether that's within the, you know, the boundaries of acceptability. 
And here it's saying, how smart am I versus how much I don't know? Let me give you a quick example. Uh, okay, I want you to think of a, of a pie. And I take a slice out of that pie. I take a wedge out of the pie. The wedge that I take out is how much I know my, uh, my treatment accounted for. So I have a pie, I take the wedge out, and I go, that wedge accounts for my treatment. I know for a fact that my treatment was responsible for this. All other changes, I don't know. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. Percentage of variance explained. So if I have 100% variance and that wedge accounts for 20%, as my professors said to me, as they looked at me, they said, well, if you're 20% smart and 80% stupid, as they looked at me, because I was a favorite, right? So I'm 20, 80, that's the rule, right? So, but here's the deal. Of that 20% percentage of variance explained, it's like, well, I, you know, I'm not even going to get into that yet. I just want to start getting through this. But this is what percentage of variance explained the R squares. It tells me how much variance my treatment effect or my process accounts for the change in behavior. And you see there on the bottom, we have 0 0.01, 0 0.09, 0 0.25. And what you do with that R squared number <clears throat> is multiply it by 100, so you get the percent. So 0.25 times 100 is 25%. So they're saying that a large effect is 25% of the, re of the uh, variance is explained by the treatment, by the process. Now, if you think about it for a second, that does mean I'm 25% smart and 75%, I have no idea what's going on. And they consider that to be very precise and very exact. So just as a uh, rule of thumb, how much variance does a study usually account for? What's our, what's our rule of thumb? Our rule of thumb is anywhere, our R squared should be anywhere from 0.15 going up, okay? So it's like I'm 15% smart and 85% in the unknown. Not a lot, but that's what research really calls for itself, okay? And that's what we consider to be good research. So if you're reading a research article, if I go back for the 15,000th time on this, if you're reading a research article and they say their R square is sitting at about 0 0.8, 0 0.18, you can feel relatively assured that, that's, that, that that design is pretty good and that that variable of interest, that explanatory variable or that independent variable has done a pretty good job in picking up that pattern of behavior. Okay, and they're gonna list out that R square if they do a T test, they have to, it's part of the, uh, you know, it's, it's what it is. Now, can you have a small effect and then also have significance? Yes, happens all the time. <clears throat> but as a good interpreter and understander of statistical technique, you're gonna need to balance that out. So R square is a very important estimate here. R score is a very important. So you're gonna tell me, and I guarantee you this, if I have a small effect and I have significance, that value just got dragged over the line. You know, it's a very subtle finding. And if it's a big one, like a, let's say a 0.18, that, that finding flew over, the, uh, flew over the criterion easy, nice and easy. So everything is related to everything else. You can't have a large magnitude of effect and non-significance. Or you can't have a large magnitude of effect and have a small T value or Z score. Just can't happen. Doesn't make any sense, okay? You can't say, I'm um, you know, gonna play um, center field for the Yankees, but I never play baseball. You know, what's my percentage of that, you know, of that being done? Never gonna happen, okay? Sadly, but true. All right, so this is what I'm talking about, the relationship between each of the individual elements and the individual process going on here. Those elements combine to have a cohesive, cogent story as to when you look at that distilled value of whether it's significant or non-significant, all those pieces and parts need to make sense. 
So if you have a T value that's off the charts large, you're going to need to have a high R squared. If you didn't, then you got nothing. You got noise. You got a problem. And if it's in a uh, peer reviewed journal, well, guess what? That's never going to fly through a peer reviewed journal when they start to look at that. Not, not going to happen. Uh, original scores and treatment effects. I'm, I don't, I'm just going to move past that. Okay. Now we start talking about confidence intervals. <clears throat> and with confidence intervals, once again, I, I think it's kind of a bit of overkill. And I don't really know a lot of folks who kind of put it in here, but what, what the confidence intervals really talk about, in effort, when you hear confidence intervals, it's a, where is the score, what is the likelihood of a score dropping in between point A and point B? And where in, this, where in that, what's the, what's the odds of that happening or the chance of that happening? And the problem becomes for me is when you're looking at a confidence interval, which is a guess, right? Because I'm going, this is the low end, this is the high end. And what do we have here? Estimating the mean. I'm estimating something based upon an estimation. It's like, I don't, I don't, it, it just doesn't click in my head for me, you know? So this is like an alternate, alternative technique for describing the effect size. How many ways do I need to describe the effect size? If I have a Cohen estimate of the Cohen's D, I have R squareds. How many ways from Sunday do I need to do this? I ask rhetorically, right? So because they're all going to be the same thing, a structure is a structure is a structure is a structure, a finding is a finding is a finding is a finding. And if I'm going to have, if I have an outrageously good finding, a very statistically significant finding, that'll be reflected in the Cohen's D, the estimate of the D, and that'll be reflected in the R square. So why do I have to guess here about an interval that I'm kind of artificially constructing and see where it's going to fall in between to give me the same answer. So I, I you know, I, I don't like to confuse myself that often. So I don't really get in, I'm involved in this. And here it says here, every sample, I'm just going to talk about this, you know, briefly. Now you have my feeling about it. So because it's ratio data and we have our T value formula, we can arrange the, we can arrange the equation. It's kind of like taking an X value uh, a uh, Z score and, tra and transforming it back to its raw score. Yeah, you can do that, right? Uh, it's tractability, ratio data. Here you can do the same thing. So you can take all these values, jumble them up, do it, and you can find you know, the equation for solving where it falls into the confidence interval. Okay, don't really know, don't really care that much about it. And, but, it but for our intents and purposes, if you see it, now you know with that it's built upon the T and kind of working the T around. Okay, any T distribution, the values pile up around T equals zero. What does that mean in English? Once again, it's the same construction. It's all around the mean, right? Those two sets of 66%, two thirds of the scores are falling around the mean. Okay, and here, just like in power, when they had like beta minus one, which I didn't talk about, but I saw that, I said like, I don't wanna deal with it, right? So for any alpha, we know where it's gonna fall in between. I don't, it's the same thing looking at it from, in, from a different point of view. And like I said, a structure is a structure is a structure is a structure. And if they put the confidence intervals in there into a, or into a research piece that you're reading, Guess what? They're also going to add R squareds and they're also going to have Cohen D's. So you have two pieces of information that should align together, absolutely knowing what's going on and how what the magnitude of effects are. <clears throat> so here they have this example. And you know, so with that, they do all the little numbers, they go to the T distribution table, they find it's 2.36, and then 95% of the time it'll fall out uh, between these two values. Okay. That and a swipe in the Metro card or the Omni card gets me on the bus. Okay, here we go. Here we see this. We looked in the back of the book and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, T distribution, boom, here's the value. Scores that are greater than 2.3, significantly different, plus or minus two, right? Everything else, two thirds of the scores are gonna fall out over here. 
add another 25% or 26% if we add on another distribution, another, um, another uh, deviation, right? And then these are 5%, you know, two and a half and two and a half, the last 5%. These are your outliers. These are the difference makers. Okay. Um, they want to talk about constructing a, a confidence interval? No. Okay, desired confidence intervals. So this is when you're reading this stuff, right? When more confidence is desired, the width of the interval increases. Well, think about it. If I say that if I, if what's the confidence interval of getting, let's say a mean of five for argument's sake, if I increase those two barriers, you know, the low end and the high end, I have more confidence that that score's gonna fall in. So it's like hitting the side of a barn or hitting like a, you know, or hitting like a tiny little wall or something, right? The larger those confidence intervals spread, the more confident I can, I, I can feel is that it's gonna fall in there, right? When it's tighter together, the, in, the width of the interval is gonna decrease. It makes it harder to fall into that, into, into, that, into that space, okay? Rocket science, right? The wider it is, great. Intervals can, can increase. Terrific. If I keep it tight together, guess what? It's going to make it harder to get in there. Okay. So, okay, fine. This is what I'm saying, but I can see that through magnitude of effect and I can see that through uh, R squares. Okay. Sample sizes. Once again, a larger sample, smaller standard error. And I went through that, right? And then you get a smaller interval. Because the more that I have, less distance between, I account for more variance, that's my smaller error term. And so because I can do that, the intervals are gonna be smaller because if everybody gets a 90 on a test, the distance between everyone is small. I can see that pattern kind of emerge a lot more. Smaller the sample, 10 people, I get a larger standard error because there's little things and everyone's bouncing around like ping pong balls. And then the intervals are gonna be larger because I need to account for everything. So kind of use a little bit of a picture in your head, larger sample, think of everybody crowded on a train and the distance between everybody, the world traveling to work. So it's a smaller interval. Now, if I have a smaller sample, I take a train, let's say at midnight, right? There's less people on it. So there's more, it, there's more space between us, right? So I'm gonna, that's gonna be a larger standard error because I don't know where everybody's going or doing. And there's gonna be a larger interval. Right, because of everything is larger. So kind of think about it in more in concretized terms when you look at these values. The numbers need to have no longer be numbers, but they need to have construct to them. They need to have, you need to have an understanding with them. So you're gonna to start to force yourself a little bit as you move forward with your, with your school and your career and your reading of research that it's not numbers and say that they don't have, they're just, it's just a thing on a printed page. They have, they have depth, they have flavor, they have, you know, intensity and they have meaning. So don't look at it as a number, say like, okay, does all of these things make sense? If I have this, does the next one follow? Does the next one follow? Does the next one follow? You don't have to be a number cruncher to kind of start to make these associated leaps and these, and these consistencies when you start to look at data. Large sample, so you know that you're gonna have a smaller error. And then, you, and that means it's going to be less distance between all the values, and that's going to have an impact on significance and on how much my R squares are going to be. My R squares are going to be very large because I'm accounting for everything. Okay, so that's really what you need. The kind of way you have to think about it. Here is how they report the results in, um, you know, the testing uh, in a paper. If the null is rejected, failed to reject. This, that, here. The T, eight degrees of freedom. Here's what the T value was. Here's my alpha, there's my P. You know, you've seen this a thousand times. And here, when they put this down as the exact probability, they've usually done like a statistical run where like SPSS or R or SAS or SysStat or any of these programs will print out the actual exact probability. Not required, but you know, everyone for precision and exactness and bookkeeping, whatever. Okay, uh, directional tests and one-tail tests, non-directional tests, most commonly used because uh, if we don't know what's going on, 
That's what it is. If it's an exploratory or a pilot study and everybody knows what a pilot, pilot study is, you're going to want to use a two-tailed test, okay? Just to get a better understanding of the directionality of it, okay? You're always gonna use the four steps of the hypothesis test. That's what you can learn in 715. Okay, the critical region is defined as just one tail because it's a plus or minus value. Okay, because the, the normal curve or the T value curve is you know, symmetrical. So what's good for one is good for the other. Uh, I need to look at that. And I think that's it. All right, so I just wanna go through before we take a break. I wanna change this for a second. I just wanna go through an example for a second if you will indulge me. Isn't it a great idea that you decided to take a class for three weeks? I know, I'm excited. <clears throat> All right, okay. That's what we call in the music biz vamping. When you're waiting for stuff to load up. All right, so now you should see here, and this has been uploaded, this is a t-test. And uh, so here we have a set of scores. And this is my sample of, let's say, you know, uh, particular class of college students in, in a class and I wanna see how their performance rates against their cohort, right? Okay, but what do I know about them? I just know what's in here. I just know everything about them. I don't know what else is going on. So I have to say, this is their mean, I can calculate their, this, this group mean, but I have to guess what the population mean is. I can get that value either from the university, I can get that value from you know, getting the demographics, but I, but I can find it or, or in a close approximation to it. All right, having said that, so now I have them all set and ready to go. First thing I wanna do is I wanna do my low hanging fruit. I, I add it up, I find my mean, right? Summation X divided by N, right? And now I do the same thing here, X minus X bar, 72 minus, 70 minus 72, right? Just like we did for Z, same thing. This must equal zero, right? If it doesn't equal zero, go back and redo it. And then I drop the plus or minus value. And then I multiply that value by itself. And then I add it up. And I get summation x minus x bar squared, which is a fancy way of saying sum of squares. Okay, so this I got this I do regardless. And I said if you can get to this point, you can do any statistics known to vex humankind. Okay, and it's just two columns. So now the next thing I want to do is I need to calculate just like in Z, I need to calculate some sort of variance value, right? Variance value in um, Z is sums of squares divided by N, right? Sums of squares divided by N. But I'm not going to do that here because this is sample data. So what I do is I do sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Why am I using degrees of freedom here? I'm using degrees of freedom here because this is my little correction factor. This is going to prevent the, the data or the findings from bleeding out. And I'm going to be able to control some of the standard error from that. Just by that one person being taken out, that's how robust statistics are, okay? So that's why I use <laughs> for T values degrees of freedom. Now, because I have degrees of freedom and I have my variance taken care of, what do I do next in Z? Now I throw a square root around variance and I find my standard deviation. But I can't do that here in a way, right? I have to do that S sub M, the estimate of the standard error. Still has the square root key, right? Because this is our proxy and this is our fill-in for standard deviation. So here this, it's S squared, which I did here, which sub variance divided by N. You see, now I do it across everybody. Why? Because here I'm controlling it and saying all the differences are being put together and I'm doing it in a much more conservative fashion. 
here I'm taking what's left and taking all the variance across all the people. So once again, I have eight students in a class. I buy a pizza that has eight slices. That's eight over eight, okay? And I allot that eight over eight. Everybody gets one. So here I take the S squared and divide it by the total number of beings. And then what I do is I do the square root of that. Now I'm good to go. Once I got that down, just like in Z, now it's the score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, same thing pops. It's the mean minus that population mean, which is over here, which we guesstimated at, where we found the value, divided by the, the standard deviation uh, proxy. So Z is the score minus the population mean divided by the standard deviation. Here is the same framework, the same, same uh, consistency. Uh, the mean minus the pop mean divided by a standard deviation. And here I just plug and chug, right? And I just do and I get a 1.66 T value. Well, I'm assuming that 1.66 is correct, is a statistically significant uh, value or else I wouldn't have continued further on here. So we have now we have to do the Cohen's D or the estimate of the Cohen's D. And here's the formula. Okay, 520, which I think is the uh, sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Okay, uh, so we have to calculate S. So sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom, square root, and we get a value of 7.6. Okay, we have all these values here. Now we flip it into the uh, formula for the plug and the chug. We already know what the, what the numerator is because we did it up here. So we know that it's 72 minus 68. So it's four divided by this value of S, which is 7.6, 0.53. What does the Cohen's 5.3 tell you? It tells you that it's a big finding, right? It tells you that this has quite a bit of uh, magnitude of effect. So not only do I have significance, I have a really good magnitude of effect that whatever we did there is really very, is really pretty intense. And now I have to do my R squares. And the R squares are I take my T value and square it, divided by the T value squared plus degrees of freedom. So I already know my T value squared is 1.66. So 1.66 squared divided by 1.66 squared plus degrees of freedom, right? I have that and I just keep taking the algebraic formula, the expansion and just keep moving it out. And I do that and I get an R squared of 0.23, multiply that value by a hundred and that's 23% of the variance accounted for. So let's see if it makes conceptual sense here. I have a significant T value I have a high magnitude of effect and I've accounted for quite a bit of the variance. I, I, think that's, I think that all kind of fits in as to the way it should be, okay? So, all right, so let's take a break. Uh, it's 10.10, 10. Uh, let's say, uh, let's, let's do 10.25. I'll give you an extra five because I went a little bit longer. All right, 10.25. All right, my friends, be back. And then we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, a little bit of a cleaner way to look at it. Maybe, maybe not, but we're just gonna go through it real fast. Then we will we'll keep moving forward. This is the t-test. This is that data that we had on the other one. And I said, I, can, I need to estimate my uh, population mean. So I have a population mean of 68. I got that through Department of Labor Statistics. I got that through the university. I got that from some credible source, but it's still an estimate and you never know, okay? But, so, but it's the best we got. I have my degrees of freedom of nine. I have my uh, elements of 10, small case n, right? Show me sample. So here I add it up, I get my mean 72, and then I do my score minus the mean, 
I do all that, I make sure that I have it zero, drop the plus or minus sign, multiply each value by itself, add it up, this is now my sums of squares, okay? From my sums of squares, the next thing I need to do is to figure out, is to say, okay, I need to get a variance measure into a standard deviation measure, then I can do my T statistic, right? That's the way the Z works. This is the way the T works. So here is my variance. It's called S squared. It's sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. So sums of squares, 520 divided by degrees of freedom, nine. I do this and lo and behold, I'm going to get that value of 57.8. Now I need to come up with my uh, standard deviation proxy. So S sub M is, this, is S squared, which is this value divided by N square rooted. And here it is. So 57.78, the square root of that is 2.4. Now I can do my T test. Okay, so it's the mean, it's my sample mean 68, I'm sorry, it's my sample mean 72 minus 68, that's my numerator, divided by S sub M, which I just calculated here, which is 2.4, gives me a T value of 1.66. I look in the back of the book, I have significance, and now I can move forward. Okay, here I wanna do a Cohen's D. Now Cohen's D is, uh, is going to be a form, you know, the formula of, uh, X minus the mean, you know, the mean minus the pop mean in the, in the uh, numerator divided by something called S. So we have to calculate S and that's relatively simple because we have it. So it's sums of squares, 520 divided by degrees of freedom, which is nine. And we find the square root of that. And that is 7.6. And I already know what 72 minus 68 is from my numerator here divided by 7.6 is going to be 0.53. And if I know 0.53 on a Cohen, that's a big number. That's a large magnitude of effects. That's a lot of intensity in the finding. Okay, so everybody's happy about that. So we have a significant finding and we have a good magnitude of effect. Last part I need to figure out is my R squares, is how much variance am I accounting for? Variance drives the model, right? So R squared is T squared divided by T squared plus degrees of freedom, right? And here, if I do all that, here you see T squared right here, 1.66 squared divided by 1.66 squared plus degrees of freedom. And that gives me 0.24. I take 0.24, multiply it by 100, and I get 24%. So I have... I have a significant statistical finding that there's a difference between this group of folks versus the population, whatever we did to them, right? Versus the population. How do I feel good about that? Yes, because I have a high magnitude of effect, a 0.5, which is pretty, which is a really good effect in a, in a Cohen. And then I'm accounting for 24% of the variance that's making the changes. And I know that it's about 20% you know, which is, is considered a good number. So I'm all above that. So everything is in the green, good to go. Okay, that's how that works. So everything should make sense. So at the end of the day, at the end of next week, after you finish and you put everything, all your stuff in and you go, great, I'm taking a break and all that. Come the fall, you're gonna have to start reading research again and you have to start doing all this stuff again. Some of these things should start to be integrated into your thinking as to how you can conceptually follow the statistical approach. So when you read that discussion section, you make sure you can feel pretty good that what the authors are saying, they're not going a bridge too far, they're not overreaching, okay? Whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter, but you just have to start thinking in that manner. So this is where I say it's the content area and not the uh, not just saying significant versus non-significant because that nobody really cares about that. Well, they do, but it's it's not the main function of what we're doing here. Okay, so now I want to get into this chapter. I want to I want to talk about this, and then we'll discuss some final administrative stuff, and then we'll 
break for the day. We have one more week left of this. We got tomorrow and it's like the rest is like, yeah, let's, I'm okay. It's a lot of work on my shoulders. And does anybody care? No. This is what we call vamping. Just complaining to complain because that's what I do. All right. <clears throat> All right, it says participants can now see the application. All right, chapter 10. Look at that. We've already like banged through. This is like where I'm like in like, oh, close to this. If this was the fall, this would probably be beginning of November. So semester starts end of August. So we're really October, November. I mean, we're like two months into the semester already. Really, and as I tell people, we're at the point of the race where it's a clubhouse turn headed for home. I mean, it's gonna, next week's gonna come up real fast. Okay, but we'll talk about that in a bit. I need to focus up. Uh, T-test for two independent samples. All right, before we get into this and we start, before I start talking about it, let's start to define the playing field. What do I mean two independent samples? What I mean by two independent samples is that let's say I teach two sections of statistics. I have one in the morning, one in the evening. I can look at those folks as either two populations, right? Or I can look at them as two samples, two independent samples of each other, depending upon the questions that I ask and what I wanna know. So if I'm just interested in the performance between the two, I would do a population test. Is my morning class better than my e evening class? Excuse me, is my evening class better than my morning class? Right? The null would say they're both the same. The alternate would say that there's a difference between the two. Okay? But let's say the question then becomes, I have these two classes, these two independent samples, and they're both being measured on uh, you know, a teaching style. One is via online and one is the classical way, you know, of going into the classroom and, and just lecturing, you know, there. So that would be a two test. That would be two independent samples because one doesn't have anything to do with the other. And then is there a difference between both of them? That's what we're looking at between the, and the uh, independent variable is the uh, teaching technique online versus live and in person, okay? So that's why we would use a t-test for two independent samples. Now, the z-structure still holds. It's still we calculate a sums of squares. It's still we calculate a variance, an intermediate variance measure. And we also uh, calculate some sort of proxy or substitution for the standard deviation, okay? We're all going to do that. And then after that, after we put everything through, you know, through the magical box and we shake it a few times, then we're going to be doing a, a Cohen's D and R squared and some other kind of stuff. Okay. So we have to understand. So that's the structure of the study of how we measure it. If I'm looking to compare two of these different classes using an online approach versus a live approach as my independent variable with two levels. That's what we would do. We would do a t-test for independence. The difference between the two populations, we have that, we'll get all this stuff down. Okay, most research studies do compare two or more sets of data, they have to. Now, within you, when you compare two sets of data, there's a, there's a difference, we're gonna talk about this tomorrow, and I'm gonna give this a much deeper treatment tomorrow. We have an independent measures, and we have in within subjects design. So what we're really talking about here is, let me just describe these. We have between subjects or independent measures or within subjects or repeated measure. When you read a research article and it talks about independent measures, you know right away that it's a between subjects design. I'm gonna explain in a second. If you read a study and it says a within subjects design was employed, well, guess what? That's a repeated measure. What are these things? Why do they vex us so? Well, here's how I want you to think about between subjects. Between subjects design is what we're talking about now. The difference between one group and another group, right? Two 
independent samples, okay? So I want you to think of the two groups as two buckets. That's why it's called between subjects, between this group and between that group. Independent of each other, never the two shall meet. If you're in the online group, you're not gonna be involved in the live and in-person group, okay? Not gonna happen. That's why it's independent and it's between. So it's two different buckets in between. That's why it's called between subjects. The other one, when they say within or repeated measure is let's say I take this class or I take one of my two classes and I have, let's say uh, 40 people in there. I'm making the math easy. And I say, okay, 20 of you are going to do an online approach and 20 of you are going to be live and in person, okay? So that would be within, because I'm taking the sample and splitting it up within, but they're still gonna be the same with, you know, with the same sample size and the same sample folks. I'm just having everybody act as their own control and experimental. And that's what we mean by repeated measure. We're repeating the experiment, each one, everybody is repeating whatever they're under over time. So repeated measure is I have the people who are learning online, they start and then I track them over time. How are they doing, right? And then the ones who are live and in person, I track them over time. I'm repeating the treatment, I'm repeating the measure. And so everybody acts as their own control and their own experimental. And I'm, not, and I'm gonna leave this topic right now because we're gonna talk about it much more in depth tomorrow, okay? But let's talk about the between subjects design or the independent measures. Two separate groups, one gets treatment A, one gets treatment B, and then I'm gonna compare them which, which treatment is better. Okay, uh, the computational procedures are different for both signs. Right, because if I'm dealing with myself and I'm taking measurements as we go along, that's going to be a whole different ball again. Okay, here each both of this design within subjects and repeated measures have pluses and minuses, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. They're just setting it up here. All right, so I have two populations. All right, here. Oh, this is good. Taught by method A, taught by method B. Online versus live and in person. I don't know what the means are, but I pull sample. Right. I get this though. I get it all prepared using my four rules. Yeah. Okay. And here you can see this is what I was kind of talking about. We have the null and we have the alternate. The null and the alternate. And it's presented as H sub naught, drop the colon in, the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group indicates that there's no significant difference between them. The zero does not mean zero. It means that the distance between them, the differences between them are not statistically significant. This is what we seek to prove each and every time out of the box. Okay, each and every time out of the box. <clears throat> Here's the alternative H sub one or H sub prime, put drop the colon in. The mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group is statistically significant. It is greater th than the difference is meaningful. This is the null and this is the alternate. We always seek to prove this. So this is always up there in the first thing. This is like the brand, the name. Point. Okay, so here's the basic structure of the uh, t-test that we're gonna be using. And I just wanna tell you this much, it's not as complicated as it looks here because I'm gonna tell you why. This gets assumed, this drops off. Let's not even assume or, or think about it. Instead. We don't even deal with this. It's, it's baked into the K. Here, as you see, instead of S sub M, because I'm using two different groups, look at the notation. It's the variance of the first group minus the second group. Okay, so it's some sort of, of concocted number. It's some sort of metric, all right? So since it's, Sample, sample is statistics, parameter is population. So this is sample, so it's a statistic. This statistic is one that we're going to create. We're not gonna create out a whole cloth, but we're gonna create, okay. And here 
is the formula for our denominator. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna get too deep into this because we'll kind of have like the light motif, the themes running through it. Okay, but as you can see here, I have two groups. And here's the takeaway from here, regardless of what these values are. I have two groups. And with these two groups, I need to account, I need to add them together. I need to what's called pooling, P-O-O-L-I-N-G. And I want you to remember that term because it's going to come up in, in a couple of slides. So we're going to pool the data. And what pooling does, once again, it's a kind of a it allows us to get a better view of things. It lets us look, think, look at things through a better lens. So the extremes are in extremes and the, you know, and the jagged edges are smoothed out and pooling allows for, not, for us not to over justify or underestimate. So that's what pooling does, okay? It's kind of like that weighted mean thing. Okay, why add the measurement samples together? Just the reason I said because you want to make sure that you're getting the cleanest view of everything where you're not increasing the error terms, okay? You can't increase them. So we're using a correction factor to make sure that things don't bleed outside the lines, that we're getting as clean a read as possible. Everything is done for a reason. Okay, and in, because we're using so many guesses and guesstimates and estimates, we're taking a very conservative approach to say each step needs to have its kind of controlling elements to it. And this, you know, because you're not going to remember if somebody says to you, like, hey, why do we add sample measurement errors, you know, but subtract sample means like, hey, why do we do that? The, the bigger picture here is the broad stroke that you need to remember is that each step of the process for each step of what a statistician does in these particular cases, and when you're reading research results, each one of those steps is used to control for the bleed, okay? Is used to control for things going outside the boxes. And if we do that as best as we can, not perfect, there's still gonna be some seepage. <clears throat> We're going to get the best view and, and cut down on our error term and increase our variance accounted for. Okay, and that'll be reflective in the R squared. So when you see an R squared that's large, you're gonna know that, that all this has been taken care of. Okay, here we have two topulations and here's what happens when you get some of the bigger differences going on here. For, uh, for instance, uh, these two population distributions, you can see that among these folks, it's pretty small, right? This distribution is kind of kurtotic. It's, it's, it's normal, but its description or its characteristics are very different than this one, yeah? This one is much more spread out. It's, it spans, it's got a greater dispersion, but it's still normal nonetheless. Can I compare both of them? Yes, because they're both normally distributed and I can do that and I'm gonna be looking at certain elements about them. But these are the kinds of issues we need to do. And this is what I was talking about, saying those third graders who are in a New York City urban school, versus suburban students who were in a, in a fancy prep school, all right? Not that the kids are different, but some of their experiences are different and some of their performance can be different, okay? Not saying one is better than the other. I don't want to imply that at all, but there's a difference in, in, in a lot of that stuff. So th this is kind of like that too. Like, let's say this is, uh, let's say this is uh, weight gain and this is weight gain among these two populations. Who knows, right? Okay. But the point is they're both normally distributed and they both look different. And that needs to be taken into account when we do these types of analysis. Okay, oh, look at that, pooled variance. Who talked about pooling? Oh, I did. Okay, so equation, so this equation shows the standard error is unbiased only if the two samples are exactly the same size. I'll explain in a second. Pooled variance provides an unbiased basis for calculating standard error. Now, let me tell you something. I wish life was this simple. Uh, if both sample sizes are the same size, winner, winner, chicken dinner, man. You are rocking and rolling. You're good to go. And everything's going to be good, right? Because it's going to be unbiased because I have 10 people here and 10 people there. So I don't have to worry about an extreme number of people being influenced by less or an extreme number of people interested by more. 
That's why I can't do a comparison of 10 people versus 50 people. It's, it's just too extreme and too wild where it's not going to happen. Okay, but if both sample sizes are the same, great. And my response to that is, this is why I shoot for more people. So let's say I need 40 people per cell. I shoot for 50, I end up with 46. I do the other group and I shoot for 50 and I end up with 44. Well, guess what? I can take two people out of here by random. And now I, now I can just pull the variance and have an unbiased estimate. I'm allowed to drop data. Okay, I'm allowed to tailor it that way. And it's independent because I didn't choose somebody because of this course. I said, yeah, I'm going to just choose two people by random and just throw them out. Good to go. Put them off to the side. So now I can compare, you know, 44 versus 44. I'm good. So here's the formula. So look at this, S squared sub P. This is our pooled variance. And it's pooled because S squared demonstrates that it's variance. Subscript of P, in this case, shows that it's pooled. So you may see this in a research article, you may not, depending upon the intensity of what they want to deliver for you. Okay, so here's the formula. The sums of squares of the first group plus the sums of squares of the second group divided by the degrees of freedom of each. Now these values are both on the denominator both going to be both going to be equal. The only thing that's going to change is the numerator, right? Didn't I say that? The sums of squares for the first group is going to be different than the sums of squares of the second group online versus live and in person. Degrees of freedom, if I have 10 people per group, that's still gonna be nine plus nine, right? It's still a winner. Now, what I want you to notice here, and I'm gonna bring it up like 16,000 times, is that there is no break in the action here. So we add these two values up together and we add these two values up together. Now, if we look at this, uh, here it is. If we look at this value here under the square root, what do we have? We do this one separately. We do this one separately. And then we add them up. So it's this first, S squared divided by that, S squared divided by that. Once we get these two values, we add them, then we do the square root. A lot of folks make the mistake of throwing a line across there and, that, and adding across and adding across and finding that square root. Don't do that, bad. Okay, here on S squared sub P for the variance, you can do that. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay, so here, estimating the standard error, this is our proxy for standard deviation. How do I know that? Well, I know that because I have a square root key right there. Anytime I see a square root key in a research article and I don't care what's underneath it, immediately you have to start thinking about standard deviation measure, okay? This is going to be our denominator, okay? The standard deviation acts as our denominator on this. And don't forget, a Z-score is a meat and potatoes research tool. T's, overall T's that we did in chapter nine, meat and potatoes tool, you're gonna see those all the time, 90% of the time. And here, the independent T-test, one class versus another class, one set of students versus another set of students, one group of Coca-Cola drinkers versus one group of Pepsi-Cola drinkers, whatever it may be, okay? They're going to use the t-test of independent samples or between subjects design. So this is common stuff. We're just going through in this class of working through it, but I wanna stop, if you will, and let you know that when you're on your own, you know, this is the things to look for to start to get you to think up here about what's going on. Okay, so this is how, this is our denominator. And of course I have a spreadsheet to show you after all is said and done. The independent, the, the, the between subjects design, we, we, we do our degrees of freedom total, okay? And they should have had here a subscript of total, T-O-T because it's degrees of freedom of the first group plus degrees of freedom of the second group. Now let's say I have unbalanced groups. I have 20 in one group and 18 in another. Okay, and I, you know, and someone's running the show. So this would be 20 plus 18, right? So this would be 19 plus 17. And this would account for any of the differences, okay? So once again, a correction factor is being installed with pooling. 
So pooling, if you see pooling in a research article and say when they pool this, that, and the other, what they're really saying is that we're controlling for extreme outcomes. We're putting everything in its relational place, okay? Between seven design, use the same four steps. Everything uses the same four steps. That's why it's called standard operating procedure. And we always use the same four steps when talking about research. Okay, we state our hypothesis, the null and the alternate with the alpha. So we have H sub naught, mean of one minus the mean of two equals zero. And once again, that's the null. And it doesn't mean that it equals zero. It means that there's no significant difference between the two group means. The alternate state is H sub prime or H sub one, the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group does not equal zero. Interpreted as saying that there is a statistical significant difference between the two means of the groups when we measure performance on each variable. The other thing is, is we have to find our alpha, little Jesus fish, 0.05. We find that in the back of the book is what's called a T table. And the column of the T table is 0.0, you'll find 0.05. And the row is the degrees of freedom. And then you run your finger across and that becomes your criteria. All right, I'll get an example of that. I don't know if there's one in these slides. Then we do our, uh, our process. We collect our data independently, right? We don't mess around, we collect it, push it all through the statistical engine. We come up with a result. If the value that we calculated is greater than the one from the back of the book, Winner, winner, chicken dinner. There is a significant, there's a statistically significant difference between the two groups. So I reject the null and accept the alternate. Okay. So I got my hypothesis stated. I find my criteria and my alpha at 0.05 using the using the t-value table in the back of the book or any appendix. You can Google it. Okay. The columns are 0.05s, use the one, one, tail, <clears throat> one tail, start there. Degrees of freedom, whatever they are, run your finger down, come up with that value in that cell and that's it. <clears throat> then I do my study, push it all through the statistical engine. And then I look at my result that I calculated. If my result is greater than the one in the back of the book or larger than alpha, I have a statistical difference and I reject the null and accept the alternate. Okay, uh, so here, uh, if we have 14 degrees of freedom at 0.05, so that means I have 15 people. <clears throat> if I look in the back of the book, what I'm going to find is that that value 0.05, 14 degrees of freedom, is going to be 2.145. If the value that I calculate after all is said and done exceeds 2.145, it's an outlier. It's significantly different than all of the scores here. And then I can say that whatever we did, it's different. <clears throat> okay, that's how that works. This is the visualization of the T uh, distribution. Here's our criterion, surpasses it, winner, winner, chicken dinner. If it doesn't, if it doesn't meet criteria, then we go, it's no different than the mean. No difference of whatever we did. Okay, we use a directional test when predicting a specific direction, when it's justified. So if we're looking at uh, teaching by teaching online or teaching uh, live and in person, well, I cannot use a one-way directional test. I don't know which one is better, it's unknown. So it'd have to do a two-tailed test. If I was looking to say I have one group that I'm giving aspirin to for headaches, and one group that I'm giving M&Ms to, then I know the directionality. I can make a justified guess to say that the aspirin, I'm gonna use a one tail test on the negative because aspirin is going to reduce the amount of time. So I want more negative, okay? And I can do that. That's how I justify it. Some people may disagree with me. Some people may agree with me, some colleagues, but that's open for discussion when I send it out to get uh, 
reviewed for publication. You know, that would be a critique. Why, you know, we don't accept your justification. Not the first time it's happened. Okay, it won't be the last time. Okay, so that's what we're looking at when we use the test. Two different teaching techniques. You know, say, I don't know which one's going to be better. I can't tell. So I have to account for both under the curve. If I have something that I can quantify, like a medication reducing headache, I could say, yeah, I'm going to do one tab because I know time is going to be less, going to be helpful. Okay, once again, the underlying assumptions that we always know. Uh, with each sample, everything must be independent. Once again, with the independence, we know this. We're not allowed to, we're not allowed to sway anybody's vote or anybody's performance. We can't change things. We can't say, oh, this is what they meant. Two populations of samples must be normal. Of course they're normal. We selected the populations. We put the criteria on. They met our criteria. Okay? Have to be the same. And here's where we start to get the rub. The two populations from which the samples are culled must have equal variances. What does that mean? This is where the rubber meets the road on an independent t-test. Homogeneity of variance. We seek to get homogeneity of variance. That means both groups are similar to each other, that they're not different from each other. So if I give you a very quick example, if I'm looking to produce a test, that looks at third grade math skills, and I give it to a group of third graders to do math, and then I give the other test to a group of uh, Harvard students. And lo and behold, guess what? I'll find a, a significant difference, right? Intuitively, yes? Yes. Well, what does that mean? Just because I find a difference doesn't mean that it's valid right, doesn't mean that it's a real true finding that is useful for me, because don't forget, statistics is an artificial approach. You just say, what do you want me to do with the values, with the numbers? Put them here, do this to it, subtract from it, multiply it, do what it is, find a square root, drop it over here. Okay, great, just did that, next. That's what homogeneity of variance is used for. Are the two groups similar? If I have my third graders and my Harvard students, and I look at that, that would be called Heterogene, heterogeneity of variance. I don't want heterogeneity, okay? Because that means they're different. I want to compare apples to apples. I want to compare this group of third graders to a similar group of third graders, okay? Homogeneity of variance is also goes under the rubric of contrast effect, okay? looking at the, sometimes they do it on purpose to look at the differences between third graders and Harvard students. What, what can we identify that makes them unique? But in essence, we're looking to make sure that, that this homogeneity of variance has to be tested for. And we have a test for it and we will discuss it. I know, I'm excited too. Uh, the test for homogeneity of variance is called Hartley's F-Max test. And we're going to go through it and we're going to talk about it, but here it is at the end of the day, and here's what you need to remember. This is underlined in box three times about it, the FMAX. This is the only statistical test that you do not want to be statistically significant. Hartley's FMAX test is the only statistical test you do not want to be statistically significant. All right, you, do, you don't want significance with the FMAX because if I have significance, that means group one is significantly different than group two. And the whole purpose of doing, an, uh, doing a between groups t-test or between, between groups or an independent t-test like this is to make sure that the two groups are similar so they're not significant from each other. So the Hartley's FMAX test is a very important uh, statistic that we look at. And what's interesting is, or I don't know what interesting, but you know, as the gambler in me kind of says it's like, yeah, we do the FMAX after all is said and done. This is like the cherry on top. And a lot of times it'll be like, whoops. So even if you use third graders and third graders, there could be a difference between them. You know, you could have a really 
can have a really sharp group of third graders, regardless of where they are. And you can have an average or a little bit of, of you know, uh, that they're a little bit, I don't want to say slower, but they're, they haven't learned as, as quickly and as fast, you know, they have a different cadence. So, you know, that could be, that could show a difference. So it's always a crapshoot. Okay. Uh, they start to talk about a pooled variance alternative. Okay. Uh, we're not going to get into that. This is just really to demonstrate to you that there is a difference between, uh, you know, there's a ratio data thing and we can express all the mathematics differently. But at the end of the day, all roads lead to Rome. So if I want to go from New York to, to Miami, I can drive, I can take a train, I can take a flight, I can take a direct flight, I can take a flight that goes from Cleveland, Detroit, Kansas City to Florida. I mean, there's many ways one can accomplish this and eventually get there. But I don't like to test my patients and I don't like to test like my, and I don't want my, my, my strength stacked. So what we have here is just a very long and excruciating way to figure out degrees of freedom, as opposed to saying, I have 10 people in this group, I have 10 people in this group, I have nine degrees of freedom here, I have nine degrees of freedom here. And my degrees of freedom uh, underscore total or my total degrees of freedom is 18. Why am I overcomplicating it? Once again, it's like a function of people trying to show off how smart they are. It's like, okay. To me, that only gets you in trouble. All right. Uh, I was going to tell a story, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to keep moving forward. All right. So now, because this follows also like the Z formatting, if you will, and the same type of moving the rock up the hill that way, we, we do all this stuff. And now we have to get the Cohen's D, the estimate of the Cohen's D. Okay. So if we have a significant finding, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to move forward we're going to have to find out what's going on how much is the magnitude effect how much intensity did my manipulation have is so if i have a significant event between online versus live and in person well then guess what now i need to figure out which one the strength of that difference okay and there's also i can do is the um, r squares now here it says you can do either or. I'm a big believer in doing both because it's another piece of confirmatory evidence because I already have all this information and I already have all this information. So to me, it just makes the case stronger and I get, and I get potentially one less argument. You know, there's always somebody in the back of the room at a presentation that says, well, you did the uh, R squareds. What is the uh, Cohen's D uh, you know, value? Oh, I didn't do that because I subbed out the um, R squares and they just like go, you know, they just tisk tisk me, you know? So now I just, because I got burned once like that, uh, I do them both. So now you'll leave this, you'll probably see both in every paper that you read or if you don't, but it doesn't matter. The structure is a structure is a structure. If a Cohen's D is high, your percent of variance is gonna be high too. So you'll still be able to make the same inferences and guesstimates about it. All right, let's move forward here. Uh, the sample mean differences. This is once again for the confidence intervals. Like I said, the confidence intervals, I, I don't like to put a lot of emphasis on that. A lot of people use them. So if you see them, you'll know that here's my lower end, here's my upper end, and the score can drop anywhere. You know, there's a reasonable probability or likelihood that it'll drop in there. Okay, not a particularly big fan of that because I just think it, it, it's oblique. It doesn't really give me a whole lot because I already know the characteristics of the, um, and now you know the characteristics of the normal curve. Around, this, around the mean, I'm gonna get two thirds of my scores, pull out another standard deviation. I'm gonna add another 25% on both sides. So that's accounting for like 95% of stuff. And then I have my outliers. So I know my scores are gonna fall if they're, not, if they're not significantly different, they're gonna fall within one or two standard deviations. That's good enough. That's close enough, as good, close enough is good enough for me. You know, because when I'm reading a research article, I'm gonna look at this, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. You know, it's superfluous. Okay. I'm telling you, if some colleagues of mine heard that, they'd be like the Monopoly guy going like, oh my God, 
you know, it's like pretty blasphemous. But I'm trying to get you to a point of saying like, reading a research article, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chaff and there's a lot of wheat and they put everything in, in the kitchen sink for, you know, for completeness. And you don't need to concern yourself. A lot of it is just redundant. So why do you, you, you need to push through. You're, you're, a, you're a knowledgeable user. You're not, you're not the crunchmeister, you know? All right, en enough of that. Uh, so the estimates can provide an indication of the size of the treatment. But I'm doing, but I'm getting the Cohen's D or the R squared. So I can infer from that. Once again, a structure is a structure is a structure is a structure. An estimate of the indication of the significance of the effect. Cohen's D, anybody say? R squared, anybody say? Right? All roads lead to Rome. And I don't need to go through every pathway to kind of confirm each and everything that I'm doing. Okay? So, like I said, you're going to read a research article and it's going to be, you know, a lot of information crunched in there. And like I and as you know, you're going to get to the statistical part. You're going to go, yeah, 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 statistically fine. Okay, great. They, they wouldn't go any further if there wasn't significance and just bypass it. And then you start reading the discussion section. I want for you to at least do yourself a favor, okay? And then look at the statistical section and start to identify the different elements that they're saying. The standard deviation, the mean, okay? Even the confidence interval and see what the, what the Cohen's D is, the estimate of the D, to see what the R squared is. This is gonna give you a wealth of information and enrichment of, of understanding maybe not so much of what they did, but when you start to read the discussion, you'll start to see the structure is a structure is a structure. And are the, are the authors making a case that's a bridge too far or really something that's a little bit of a stretch? Are they underestimating their result? I mean, you're there to think. You're not just there to read a research article just to say, okay, I read it, check. You're there to learn something for yourself and to question stuff. I know I'm going on a philosophical bent and I know I'm kind of going off, you know, off the rail a little bit, but this is the, this is the whole, my whole raison d'etre when I talk about this stuff to, you know, for folks who are not going to be researchers, okay, who are going to be research consumers, at least know what you're buying into. And don't assume that everything that people do on research is correct. There's always stuff that they're trying to finagle around with. Now, like I said, you're not gonna be an expert after three weeks of doing this, but practice it. And you'll find that even if you add a little bit to it, 10% to your knowledge base. I mean, that's a keeper. You know, that's not, that's, I'll say this much. That's a significant, statistically significant difference. Okay, aren't I clever? All right, so here, I don't wanna go through that. Uh, here's how the reporting results of an independent measures t-test. Okay, whether there was a difference between the two groups. They have the descriptive stats in there. These are the means and the standard deviations. Look for them. It's right there in the analysis, and I'll be right there. You'll see the mean, and the mean may have some meaning to you. I don't know. It may have an understanding. But the, but the standard deviation should have a meaning for you. Larger than three, you got like, okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Four, a lot of stuff going on there. Less than three, hey, pretty tight. Okay, so there you go. They report the T value and the degrees of freedom. So now you know if the degrees of freedom is like seven or eight, you know there's like nine people in this whole mess and you know what that means. That has implications, okay? The p-value, which is the probability, which is usually set to 95, as you see it right here, okay? Gives you an understanding of what the global picture looks like, what the holistic thing is, okay? To start to visualize it in your head. Now, I know that it's easy for me to start saying this and me to sit here in my bully pulpit and, you know, bang my shoe up on the desk, you know, making noise. But, and I've been doing this for literally four decades, but, you know, my young Boolean ninjas, as we say, you got to start somewhere. And if you just look at some of these simple elements and understand how they were derived, that will increase your knowledge base and your understanding and your discussion of things to a much greater degree. So if you're working in a lab and you know, and I've had students come up to me and I've repeated this before, 
uh, what do I do? I, I did the statistics and there's a difference between group A and group B. Other than saying I have a statistical difference, what can I say? This gives you information on what you can say. Looking at the means, looking at the standard deviations, looking at the distributions, looking at the descriptive. I mean, that's the enriched stuff, okay? That's like, you know, saying like, oh, I didn't know I could put cheese and bacon and slice of raw onion on my hamburger. I didn't know that existed. Okay. You need everything else to go with it to make it a much better dish. And these are the little tiny things. These are your little accoutrement, as they say, that allows for that to happen. All right. Enough ranting. All right? Like I said, I'm by myself, so I'm just ranting here. Okay. Standard error is directly related to sample variance. Oh, I'm going to say no kidding. What are they saying here in English? Standard error. That's how much the difference is. I don't know, right? It's related to, has to be related to something because everything's related to everything else, to the sample variance. Sample variance tells me how much differences I have. And then also what I don't know. That's the I don't know is the standard error. It's the inverse of it. Okay? So that's why all variance has error. Error has variance. This lets me know the sample variance tells me how smart I am. The error variance tells me how much little, how little I know. Larger variance leads to larger error. Didn't I hear that? So the more variance I have, the more differences I have, what can I say descriptively? The data is like a big cloud. The scores are all over the place. There's a great deal of difference between them in the, in the distribution. So that means I have a larger variance. That means my standard deviation is going to be high. All right? And that means my t-value is going to be lower. So that means my t-value is going to be low, but my criterion is going to be high because that's the offset. It's going to be harder for me to get significance. Right? You see that? All the stuff's out there. I don't know what's pushing. I don't know what's pulling. I don't know what the hell's going on. How am I going to get significance? The built-in correction factor with the degrees of freedom and things of that nature is going to prevent that bleeding, as I said. So the criterion is going to be very high for us to meet. The bar is going to be high for us to meet to get significance, right? So the likelihood of me getting significance because I, can't, I have so much chaff in the wheat, I'm not going to be able to clean it up. It's going to be very hard for me. So the larger the variance is to a larger error. Scores distance, right? Okay. Larger samples produce smaller error. Keep repeating myself. This keeps repeating itself because it's an axiom that's true. Larger samples. The larger my sample, the closer it will represent the normal curve. Law of large numbers. So this way, my results are more stable. They're more consistent. And I don't overestimate and I don't underestimate. What's a large sample? The book starts talking about 30 people per experimental cell. Well, I don't like to cut it so close because the world is imperfect and research is a messy business. So I shoot for 50, hope I show up with 40, and then I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about my power and any of that stuff, right? That's a good research design. That's a good way to get my sample in. Okay. So we like I said, errors related to variance. Boom, right? Larger, the more variance I have, the more dispersion I have, the less understanding I have. Therefore, it's harder for me to get to see if a pattern is truly gonna going to explode up. Okay. Larger sample, law of large numbers, smaller error, closer approximation to the normal curve. And these are the kinds of things you need to kind of think about when you're looking at a research article, right? You know, like, well, if they're using 12 people, 12 people isn't as good as 30 people. So now, you know, with less people, it's going to be kind of jaggedy. It's kind of the, you know, scores can be, you know, they're going to be out there a little bit. So a true finding may be hidden, or it may be, you know, a type one, type two error kind of thing, where I have a real finding and I don't even call it because it's so hidden. Uh, yeah, two different treatments here. Okay, uh, similar number of people, the means are different. 
Let's say this is M and N's. Let's say this is let's say this is uh, aspirin, and this is M and N's. And here, my mean of res resolution is smaller than this one. And now I want to compare them, and the variants are, st are, are still the same, right? Because these are these are the same folks. Okay, so here's how it kind of looks visually with two different samples. Uh, this is just a different way to represent it. If I looked at all the scores and I just broke it out. I think it's confusing, so I'm just going to move past it. Here on this slide, I left this in here because, as you see from the top, SPSS output. Now, one thing about SPSS and one thing about SAS, uh, statistical application package, and a lot of these professors and a lot of folks these days are using R. And I have to tell you something. Um, a lot of professors and a lot of statistical professors, uh, people, statistical professors, and a lot of folks who are quantitative analysts, they're extremely frugal, okay? Extremely frugal. And SPSS is a pricey product. And SAS is a pricey product. And all of these commercially available, you know, manufacturers of you know supported products are pricey the licensing fees are pricey okay so somebody came up with an openware source open sourceware or openware source source of a statistical package called r and because it's open source and it's built upon a different kind of platform and it's a freebie uh a lot of the statisticians love to use it why because it's at the right price and I said, like, and everyone was trying to talk, my, my colleagues was going like, hey, man, you got to use it. You got to get into it. You know, you're going to love it. It's going to be great. <clears throat> I downloaded it onto my machine. I started, I started opening it up. I had it on my machine for about 20 minutes, and then I took it off because it's all programming language. It's not point and click. So I don't use R. I know I'm going on to a, a, a tangent, but I'm just kind of making a point here. <clears throat> And you have to do every, it's not a self-serve kind of thing. It's like going into a restaurant and they say, make your own meal and we're going to charge you for using our kitchen utensils and product and whatever. I don't like that. You know, I'm going in and buying a meal. I want my statistical package to do the heavy lifting for me. I'm not doing my own heavy lifting. So when people say that they're using R, you need to use R. Good luck. All right. Very difficult. I like the point and click. I like to put all my data in and all that. So anyway, SPSS is a point and click and it does it and you put everything in and it does what it's supposed to do. If you have a little bit of time, you can play around in uh, Excel, take an, we go on YouTube and take an Excel class in statistical analysis. You can do that too. It's very helpful. But this is what a printout looks like. Okay, this is what the printout looks like. And what it has here, it has stuff in here that you don't really use, okay? It does a Levine test for equality of variances. This is a different version of Hartley. Can I get Hartley with this? Yes. So I would have to go in and I would say, instead of Levine, use Hartley. And then just, it's just a click the tab. If I was using R or some other much more complex uh, program, I'd have to go in and say, you know, not Levine, you know, go here and get uh, this, and here are the parameters for uh, F max, whatever. Not interested. So here, but anyway, what they're doing here is they're giving me my different groups, right? Here's the here's what we need to look at: the different groups. Here's the means. Here's the standard deviation between them. Here's the standard error of the means. Okay, so this is the stuff that I was talking about. Independent t, independent t tests. If we're looking at the different variables, we can see here how it plays out. This looks like the uh, equality, the, the test for the means. I don't want to start talking about Levine, but it looks like here that because of this difference, that there's some significance here. Okay, and here we assume. More like the uh, Hartley right here, equal variances. So you can see that that is not a significant value. Okay, 
so what so what a lot of these programs do is you're really interested here in the group statistics and that's really where the rubber meets the road and just like get the the cones d the estimate of the d and the uh, r squares and you can do that and hartley f max and you can do that through the options under each of the variables so my point is don't be so afraid of spss or sas okay be afraid of r kidding but here you can do all this if you just give it some thought of what you need to look at so you know with a t with a t or is with a t test you know you need hartley f max you know you need uh cohen's d and you know you need r squared so underneath t test under the nested uh, menus you'll be able to find each one of those results okay so now we're done with that. And what I want to talk about is I want to get into uh, the spreadsheet. I want to just do this spreadsheet. Independent. OK, what I'm going to do now, and I know it's getting a little late. It's, uh, it's 11.30, I've about an hour and change. I want to take about five. Let's um, let's kick back at eleven forty and we'll finish it up. Yeah.